guys. Hi guys, what's up YouTube family? Jess and Ian checking back in. Hope you guys are doing great. Hope you're working towards your dreams. Hope you're one step closer to all the success you guys want. Make sure you're smiling. Make sure you're happy. Make sure you fall in love. So guys, today's topic of the day is a topic that many people have touched on already. I felt like not much attention has been given to this topic by Islamic scholars and people who venture down the path of Islamic studies because this topic alone showcases the weak points and a big crack in the Quran. So let's get into the topic of today, guys. I'm excited to talk and share with this with you guys. So guys, today's topic is about the famous argument about the Quran being very vague in who is Dul Karnain, which means the one with two horns. Now many skeptics have claimed that Dul Karnain is none other than Alexander the Great. However, the refutation by Muslims is that the Quran is mentioning a Persian king or a king figure and not Alexander the Great. The modern day Muslims say it must be referring to Cyrus the Great, the Persian king who liberated the Jews. We will show you how the person being mentioned here is truly Alexander the Great and how this alone debunks the Quran as being the word of God. For starters, guys, more than 2,000 years ago, Alexander the Great would be the most famous hero in ancient times. The great Macedonian king was no fool as he received a legendary education as a boy. He was tutored none other than the famous Aristotle, who, by the way, would shape the Islamic Golden Age along with the likes of Plato and Socrates. Alexander managed to accomplish the impossible, which was defeating the Persian army at the Asian Minor territories, and then he would go on to defeat Darius, who was the Persian king who practically ruled half of the world. Now look at this map really quickly, guys, just to see. small of a force Alexander was and the feat that he accomplished. Now before Alexander accomplished completely annihilating the Persian army or Persian kingdom, he went to Egypt who was a, per a Persian ally but the Egyptians didn't like the Persians. But anyways, Alexander went to Egypt and won over them and created an alliance. And it will be here that Alexander will become a god. From Macedonia, Alexander will conquer all the way to India. Just imagine, in 12 years, Alexander would do the impossible and truly live up to this godlike status. He would be an inspiration for many, and he would be the seed for legendary tales. Alexander, at the time of conquering Egypt, would become a pharaoh by legitimizing his claim to a lineage of pharaohs by saying he was the son of Amun-Ra. Now stay with me guys, this is very important. Amun-Ra was an Egyptian deity that was depicted with two horns like a ram. That is why after his death, they made a currency with his face on it with the horns of Amun to represent Alexander's divinity. This currency would be widely circulated in Egypt and the Middle East. So after Alexander's death, he would be known to the world as the one with two horns, where the horns would become a fundamental part of his identity. In the Bible, if you check this verse out, <laughs> chapter 8, we can see a biblical allusion to the Alexander to Alexander the Great, where he is the goat destroying the ram, where the ram is representing the Persian King Darius. It is even of importance that Alexander would be represented as a goat because the goat has smaller horns versus the ram. So it's signifying the fact that Alexander was a very small dot on the map. He was able to destroy Darius, who covered majority of the map. Also, the ram is a male sheep, so it represents how sheep's flock and follow orders, whereas the goat doesn't listen and is very stubborn, hinting at Alexander's nature. It even goes on to add the mighty four kingdoms he will have and how great he will be. The History of Alexander the Great Syriac Version by pseudo calisthenes
this right here this book you guys can go ahead and buy it to see all the sources and everything that's in it states that alexander in egypt would be known as possessor of two horns now according to muhammad's biography by ibn Ish ishaq the Qureshi tribe set out a mission set out, set out a mission to this guy to go to the Jews in Medina and ask them to give questions that only they know so they can prove Muhammad is a liar or if he's a true prophet. So out of the three questions you can see here guys one of the questions specified here was to ask about the mighty traveler who reached the confines of the east and west. They're basically telling him to ask Muhammad if he knows about the stories and tales of Alexander the Great. It's worth noting that many wouldn't know him by that name, but simply the legendary one who possessed two horns. Now, when they pressed Muhammad about these three questions, guys, he said he would deliver an answer tomorrow and Jibreel never came. So Muhammad went 15 days at least without getting answers from God. And he became sad and cried. This is more than enough time, guys, for Muhammad to find the answers to these questions from a knowledgeable source. Then suddenly Gabriel shows up and delivers the Quranic surahs to answer these questions. He said when they ask about the mighty traveler, they're referring to Dul Karnain. So I will recite to you a remembrance of him. Now guys, the Arabs knew the tales of Dul Karnain for a long time as it was passed down to them from since the end of Alexander's quests. According to the biography here guys, you can see, it says stories from the foreigners where Dul Karnain was Egyptian and a Greek descendant. Now, this is obviously Alexander the Great, guys. It's even telling you that there were stories being told and passed around. And they knew of this figure and what the stories were telling them. That he was Egyptian and he was of Greek descent. And who was that, guys? <laughs> Alexander the Great. Now, let's look at the Quran. Chapter 18, verse 83 to 100. Is where Muhammad claimed Allah told him the famous story of Dul Karnain. If you pay attention to the book on the Syriac Alexander legend, which we pointed out earlier, you will notice that the Quranic verses Muhammad used were almost identical to the Syriac Alexander legend. In verses 83 to 84, it says that basically God gave Alexander everything from power to land. In the Syriac legend right here, we can see the emphasis of Alexander thanking God for giving him the two horns, the, that possessive trait that distinguishes him from any other hero. And he is praising God for all he has. Verse 86, it says, Dul Karnain traveled to a setting point of the sun, where it sets in murky waters and where he met some people. Then it says, we said, Zul Karnain, do we push them or treat them kindly? Clearly, this is identical to the Syriac legend of Alexander, where in the legend it says Alexander and his crew's crew set sail on the seas and met a group of people after reaching dry land and asked if they needed to be punished or not. Verse 90 is identical to the Syriac version of Alexander finding people who was being burnt by the sun. Verse 93 to 100 is an identical story about Alexander. Alexander gathers smiths to build and melt brass and iron to make the gate to keep out Gog and Magog, just like the verses 95 to 96 state. Verses 98 to 99, where the Quran speaks of the trumpet being blown and hell for the disbelievers, is the identical story where Alexander talks about the end of the world and the day of judgment. So, 
So as you can see here, guys, there was no divine message <clears throat> from God being transmitted to Muhammad through an angel. Muhammad copied this story and used the very same technique he uses for other biblical references in the Quran by summarizing a main idea of something a neighboring city or nation could relate to. So people can confirm he is telling the truth. The alibi that he is illiterate is a mechanism used to ricochet all suspicion that he made this up himself. This Syriac legend came out around the time of Muhammad's death or before 630 AD. Now mind you, the legends of Gog and Magog and all these biblical allusions and everything we spoke about were known centuries before Muhammad. But we're specifically noting the Syriac version. Now guys, the Uthmanic Quran is compiled in 652. So even then, there was plenty of time to edit, rework, and polish. Muhammad knew of this story and like other stories, copied it and claimed God gave him these revelations. In the biography, we can even see this guy here, al Harid, accused Muhammad of telling stories and basically claiming it was from God. This guy put Muhammad on the spot and almost exposed him. So he had his bandits chop off this guy's head. Can you believe that? There is even a tough seer where al Tarabi thinks a Quranic verse was in relation to this beheading. Anyone who accused Muhammad of copying and stealing poetry or stories died brutally by his hand. To finish off guys, we know 100% this story was a copy of the Christian Alexander legend. And Cyrus the Great could never be this, nor does he fit the description. This image here. The one image of Cyrus displaying two horns was actually a ceremonial hat called the Hemhem -hem crown, which is a combination of multiple things and not simply a horn. Cyrus the Great may have been a monotheist but had love for all religions as he allowed many people, including the Jews, to restore their religions and temples. That's why he's in the Bible as well because he freed the Jews and allowed them to rebuild the Temple of Solomon, which he paid for. Cyrus the Great didn't believe in Allah or even knew who Allah was. No one ever called Cyrus the Great the possessor of two horns. Now guys, the reason Islamic scholars and the Islamic community is shaken up by this information and the thought about Dulkar name being Alexander the Great is that because now we know that Alexander was a bisexual polytheist and for Allah to confess that he gave greatness to the Prophet Dul Qarnain would crumble the Quran even more. That's why they tried to find another king to fit the description, but they can't run from the evidence that Muhammad copied the Syriac Christian legend and that this person truly is Alexander the Great. Lastly, guys, the Christians themselves couldn't fathom the idea that a bisexual pagan basically con could conquer the world from nothing. How could God Almighty allow this? So they molded and created stories and legends of Alexander basically being a Christian so it fits well with their religious ideology. And Muhammad didn't know this. It also shows that Allah is made up is a made up God because why would the all-knowing God lie and tell us inac an inaccurate representation of Alexander the Great? This error made by the Creator Allah shows that Muhammad was the perpetrator, director, producer, and actor of creating Islam. The fact that Muhammad falsely represents a pagan king as a monotheistic worshipper exposed him even further. Anyone quick to dismiss this is either ignorant or trying to turn a blind eye. So the theological aspect of Islam is preserved, and I mean, that's fine if you want to live a lie. So guys, this is why you must free yourself and realize Muhammad lied about Islamic heaven and the Islamic hell and forged and paraphrased stories from all over to create the Quran. This is why the Quran is a book of law and not a book of wisdom. And the fact that people are killing people in the name of Islam is so sad when they don't know the truth that he made it all up. No Muslim can refute this claim because there's too much evidence that's pointing to Alexander the Great. So they tried to ramble and talk over it. At the end of the day, guys, this point alone exposes the weakness of Muhammad's claims and proves that this is a man-made religion. 
Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope you guys open up your mind. Much love for me and Jess. Bye guys. Bye guys. Stay tuned for the next video.